All right, so by my clock, it is the top of the 2 p.m. hour here on the East Coast. So uh, thank you all for joining us. My name is Jamil Jaffer. I'm the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute at George Mason University's Anton Scalia Law School. We're thrilled today to be hosting Commissioners Mignon Clyburn and Gilman Louie at the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence for panel discussion moderated by Chris Bringer Reuters. I'm gonna do some introductions. I'm gonna hand it over to Chris to take it away. So uh, the Honorable Mignon Clyburn was sworn in for her first term as commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission in August of 2009 and also served as acting FCC chairwoman in 2013. She's currently a principal at MLC Strategies, provides strategic advice and critical solutions in technology, media, telecom, and to investor-owned utilities. While at the FCC, Commissioner Clyburn was committed to closing the digital divide. She's an advocate for lifeline modernization, which assists low-income consumers to defray the cost of broadband service. She championed diversity in media ownership and initiated the inmate calling services reform, as well as emphasizing diversity inclusion in STEM opportunities and fought to preserve a free and open internet. Thank you for your service, Commissioner Clyburn. We're happy to have you with us today. Commissioner Gilman Louie is the co-founder and partner of Also Bluey Partners, an early stage technology VC firm focused on disruptive and innovative technologies. From 1999 until 2006, Mr. Louis was the first CEO of Incutel, an independent nonprofit venture capital firm established with the backing of the United States Central Intelligence Agency. Mr. Louis is an active advisor to the IC, the intelligence community, and serves on the board of visitors for the National Intelligence University. He's a consultant to the De Defense Innovation Board. He served as a member of the Technical Advisor Group for the Senate Intelligence Committee, as a commissioner um, on the National Commission for Review of R&D Programs of the US Intelligence Community, and is also, perhaps most importantly, a member of the board for the CIA's Officer Memorial Foundation. He's a long record of public service, mixed in with entrepreneurial activities, and literally received dozens of awards for various achievements, including medallions from the NGA, the CIA, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and has also received the CIA Director's Award. And last but certainly not least, my good friend Chris Bing is an investigative reporter at Reuters, focused on the intersection between cybersecurity, national security, disinformation, and corporate malfeasance. He's the winner of the Edwin M. Hood Award for Diplomatic Correspondence, the Deadline Club Award, the Reuters Entrepreneur Ent Enterprise Report of the Year Award, and the Drum Award for Investigative Reporting. He was also recognized by the Gerald R. Ford Foundation for his National Security Reporting in 2019. Chris, Commissioner Clyburn, Commissioner Louie, thank you for being here with us. Chris, over to you. Jamil, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. I'm very excited for our conversation today. I think it's a critical topic and I'm uh, looking forward to this conversation. So to get it started, um, I really wanted to start with just some of the basics to, to broaden out the conversation because artificial intelligence can mean so many different things. The commission spent so much time studying this. I think it's important to first look at the definition of artificial intelligence. So uh, for Commissioner Louis, I wanted to ask you if you could boil down what artificial intelligence is and how you define it broadly. Thanks, Chris. Um, artificial intelligence as we define it within the commission is the ability of a computer system to solve problems or to perform tasks that traditionally requires human intelligence. So that's kind of a, a, a rather broad uh, definition. Now, when you kind of dig into that definition, there are some things that the general public assumes AI is about that isn't necessarily um, fully descriptive of what AI is capable of doing or what the opportunity sets in front of us. You know, the first thing that people think about AI is um, to pass this thing we used to call back in computer science, the Turing test, right, where you have a computer AI in, in one black box and you have a human, you know, drives a speaker on another black box and you can't tell the difference between what a human is saying and what the computer is saying. Or, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to make a computer act like a human. Well, those are all particular areas of AI. It's not fully descriptive because it makes the assumption that the end goal is to create a synthetic human. What we're trying to do is use algorithms and capabilities of these computer systems to augment human capability, to do things perhaps that we're not able to do, that a machine could do better. The key part here is the ability to make cognitive decisions. Traditional computers use things called rules. They're kind of hard-coded in, you know. If you see a stop sign, right, apply the brakes, right, count for three seconds, move forward. And AI learns as it goes. Now, 
within artificial intelligence, and I think this is another real important thing for us to understand between the science fiction and the, 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 the future kind of Star Wars, Star Trek view of where AI can be and where it is today. So the ultimate holy grail is to create the general AI. We call it general AI is because it's the AI can do everything and anything better than we can, right? I mean, that's kind of like maybe one day, but today we have what we call narrow AI. It is the application of these cognitive capabilities within a narrow field of capabilities, maybe a self-driving car or an algorithm that helps you, you know, pick music better. That's narrow AI. And, and I think when you think about that and you take a step back and understand that AI is a catalyst to make things faster or smarter, you begin to realize that AI has very specific components is not just the computer and it's not just the algorithm. AI as it exists today, machine learning requires data for it to be trained on so that it can learn from and able to do its mathematical statistical analysis to make uh, more accurate decisions. It's also your ability to apply it, integrate it into applications that take advantage of AI. So you're using your, your iPhone and you know, you're know you out there with Siri or you have a Kindle and you're using Alexa. That integration of that technology makes the ease of use of those devices much more easy to use and much more powerful. And finally, in the AI stack that's really important to understand is the talent. It's not just the talent of the people who write the AI algorithms. It's the talent of the user to know how to use that AI, when to use it, when to trust it, and when to second guess it. So we got a lot of work in front of us. It's the entire stack. It's a very exciting area. We think it's gonna be really, really uh, important as you move forward. It's already affecting most people's lives today, whether you know it or not. When you take your little camera and you take a picture, there's probably an AI engine in there making your pictures better. So it's all around us. Um, but we think it has specific applications, especially around national security. So I want to drill into this a little bit more about where the use cases that AI is really being deployed today, and where do you think it could be deployed, you know, uh, from a common uh, popular standpoint within the next few years? And maybe I can bring in Commissioner Clyburn on this as well. So the use cases today, and then the use cases in the near to not the distant future. Well, you know, first, Chris, allow me to thank the Institute and Director for, for, for having me. In so many ways, uh, the realization about how much of a role AI plays in our everyday lives seems to, to pop up, appear without warning. So think about uh, something basic, like your smartphone, those voice assistants, photo tagging, facial recognition security, search engines or apps, those recommendations uh, we get and those coupons we get, um, advertising engines that are updated over social media when we go to the grocery store, that spell check that has saved our lives or has really, uh, if you've got a name like mine, <laughs> you know, complicated our lives, uh, you know, that, that's, guess what? Guess what that is? You know, that is uh, those emails and messages, those corrections, that, that's AI. And when we go um, you know, home, uh, those smart uh, devices, that smart thermostat, and when we think that fraud detection system, you know, that is all powered or fueled by AI. So uh, you know, as Louis mentioned, you know, it is already ubiquitous and the pace of innovation is doing nothing but accelerating. So it is helping to predict and spread um, the escalation of uh, pandemic outbreaks. Uh, planning and optimizing the distribution of goods and services. It's monitoring traffic flow and safety, speeding up drug and therapeutic discovery, and automating routine office functions. Uh, it is solving problems by compressing innovative timescales, uh, innovation timescales, and turning once far-fetched ideas into reality, no matter, no matter the discipline. So within the Department of Defense's Defense, which is more in line with this report and our uh, mission, 
uh, those mission sets. You know, the AI able systems will make targeting targeting more precise and reduce civilian casualties. It will improve speed, tempo, and scale of operations. It will expand reach uh, persistence uh, with which the battlefield can be monitored, augment the abilities of service members, including the way they perceive, understand, decide, adapt, and act in the course of their missions. It will improve enterprise decision-making and back office processes in all facets of the Department of Defense Governance and Management, including supply chain and logistics, finance and budget and HR and talent de development. So Chris, uh, AI is here. It is not going anywhere, but in many critical and meaningful ways, our work is just beginning. That's another great segue into this next topic point, which is the vulnerabilities that are created by artificial intelligence. So not just the positives that come away from it, the advancements that it can produce, but the vulnerabilities that it introduces, especially in the international security space. And uh, I wanted to turn to Commissioner Louie to speak to us a little bit on that topic. Thanks, Chris. Um, you know, there's threats all around us today. Um, we kind of we live in a in a very connected world. Um, uh, our adversaries don't need AI this week to launch the next cyber attack. Uh, AI isn't necessary to, unfortunately, operate weapons in theaters of war. Unfortunately, as we kind of look at AI, our concern is that AI becomes an accelerator to existing capabilities and a enhancer of capabilities. So if you're challenged today uh, without AI, um, uh, especially when you're working against an adversary, uh, that challenge goes up by an order of magnitude because um, the threat gets amplified in terms of what the uh, attack can now uh, reach, the speed of those attacks, um, the ability to crumble your defense systems, um, to be, operate at speeds far beyond what humans can either probe or respond to. When you saw AI into existing systems, the fundamental nature of those systems and how you use change themselves. So if you ever had our bedtime reading, which we call our AI commission report, 750 pages, you know, it's about that thick and it's a, uh, a great document to read through if you you know you have a every spare week or two to kind of go through it line item by line item. But you know if you open it up and you turn right to chapter one, right? We highlight five real concerns that we think that we need as a nation to focus in on. The first one uh, is the obvious one, right? Which is a malign information misinformation. If AI um, is used in that characteristics uh, in those kinds of systems. The AI not only can accelerate the spread of false information, but they can reorder truth in a way to get their targets to do things that they would not naturally do simply by taking facts and reordering it in a way that is more appealing to, for you to do something that an adversary wants you to do that you would not naturally do yourself. The second thing that we think is really important is, and, 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 and anybody in the data space and in the privacy space is very concerned about this, AI uh, can be used to improve data harvesting. You know, the old way uh, we protect privacy is we kind of hide ourselves in a sea of information. We say, well, you know, I'm not that particularly important. You know, it'll take a lot of effort to get information on me. There are better people to get information on. Well, if I apply AI algorithms that can go through and access countless uh, databases and, and, and understand your digital exhaust, your movements, you know, even physical movements as you go th drive your car around and you know, pass toll gates and you have GPS on your phone, an adversary can take that data and then process it at machine speeds and then begin to target you, right? Either for nefarious reasons, criminal reasons, or again, 
changing how you think and what you're thinking about, right? And your natural inclinations and begin to manipulate whole masses of the public. The third area, obviously cyber attacks, right? Cyber, we got a lot of problems today with cyber, but imagine a world where you have algorithms that can probe your defenses at machine speeds and be able to launch attacks where your human defenders, and quite frankly, if you think about it today, most of the people who protect your information systems are human beings. We have computers and they're using cyber software, but they're the ones you say, oh, there's a problem over here. Somebody should like raise the defense. By the time you even think it, all your data is out the door, right? So uh, AI really comp complicates cyber defenses. And I think the other areas is that when you apply AI uh, in and of itself, AI is, is what we call brittle. In other words, it works really well as long as nobody intentionally messes with the data, right? We call that data poisoning. If we poison the data, so it trains itself on the wrong thing. And we see this happen on the internet, right? Uh, you know, a big tech company has a chat box. They put it up. They don't put the restrictions on. And, you know, all the users say, oh, let's train this bot to say nasty things, to say bad words. And within a day, it's saying bad words and nasty things, right? That's users attacking the brittleness of AI. And that's called adversarial AI. Right. And there's a whole field of offensive activities on how to break other people's AIs. And the last thing I think we really need to be concerned about is applying AI in a bad way to bio. In a good way, we get better drugs, we get, you know, vaccines, the faster production of vaccines that we just experienced with COVID 19. Did they use a lot of AI in that analysis? On the other hand, um, somebody with ill intent, a nation state with ill intent can use that same AI to create next generation bio threats and bio weapons. So those are the kinds of vulnerabilities uh, and concerns that the commission had um, on the negative uses of AI. And of course there are positive uses that could help counteract some of that. Um, but this is pretty young field and, and we really as a commission wanted to make sure that everybody involved in the use of AI, the implementation of AI had their eyes wide open as to both the risk as well as the opportunities. Just to kind of dive into one piece of that, Commissioner Lilly, I wanted to see what your thoughts were specifically on um, war gaming and war planning and the use of AI in that specific field and what vulnerabilities that introduces. Well, I, I think if you think about uh, military affairs, let's, let's take um, some traditional gaming that has been radically transformed by AI. Um, so let's take two classical games. One game is called Go, and then another game is called Chess. Uh, there's a company called Deep Minds who applied algorithms both on the Go side, train uh, a Go engine to base a uh, algorithm to play against uh, championship players, world class players in under a day, and have that algorithm beat. Uh, a human player. So you kind of say, okay, that's, yeah, we, you know, computers have beat the human players before, computers have beaten champions before. What was interesting about that AlphaGo game was how it beat the players. It made non traditional moves that violated what were considered the principles of Go playing. Same thing happened on the chess side. Right. They applied the algorithms to chess. It's really interesting that an AI engine beat a non-powered AI engine, but it wasn't just that it went, but how it went. It took very unconventional moves to crush it. So it, now let's put us into the war planning, war uh, execution, tactical strategy side. Right. Most of our doctrine is built off of hundreds and hundreds of years of war fighting and experience, right? And the American um, uh, war fighter, right, is best in the world for its ability to think on its feet, right? Our young officers can adapt. We teach them how to adapt and adjust to the battlefield. But they're trained around these certain kind of rules on how we fight a battle. 
an adversary who uses AI against us can train systems, at least the fear is that they we will train systems to surprise and disrupt our current way of thinking and without the tools to counter those um, moves made by that AI, we could find ourselves on the wrong end of that particular fight. So um, again, it's not just a question of being able to do something faster and, and smarter, um, but AI algorithms consistently surprise the actual users. And we just ran one, uh, you know, a dog fight exercise at DARPA um, and alpha dog fight. And um, the algorithms crushed the F-16 pilot in the simulator, right? And this is an experienced pilot that we spend millions of dollars to train with hundreds of hours of, you know, combat training um, in the algorithm who was built by a team who knows nothing about war, you know, dogfight. Actually, the actual programmers themselves never flown an F-16. They might have gotten some advice from F-16 pilots, but they never flew it. And again, those algorithms just crushed um, that particular pilot in that particular set of, you know, maneuvers. So it's, uh, it's something to be concerned about. With so much at stake, you know, behind some of these questions, I wonder what should the U.S. government be doing in terms of building a workforce, building a talent pool to ultimately win in this race? And um, I think Commissioner Clyburn has some thoughts on what it would take to build a good workforce in this regard. So, Chris, I'm going to allow you to fast forward to Chapter 6. I think when we started, you had you in, in one for a few. So I'll, I'll allow you to cheat a little bit um, and, and turn to 6. As the commission lays out a vision, and it is a vision for technical talent in government to organize, recruit, build, and employ talent more effectively. And the biggest issue we see here is what we call our employee area. So let me share a non-digital workforce example. In our current pandemic, or any global outbreak, for that matter, we will need scientists, especially epidemiologists. Now let's say we want to attract the best and the brightest epidemiologists, why will we not? And let's say we convince them uh, to come on board and join our team in government. But once hired, here's what they discover, that we have no state-of-the-art practice labs, no microscopes, no samples, no data, and then we reveal to them this, that their primary expertise in their field of expertise will be a secondary skill set to their primary job. And then I'm gonna layer on something else, that we will provide no matching field enhancements for their uh, you know, careers or their line of expertise, and they will have to remain proficient in their disciplines on their own. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think they would stay or look for another job? That is exactly what is happening with digital talent today. The government has not set up the right career fields. The government has not created career paths in those disciplines. It has not uh, ensured that our workforce has the right state of practice digital tools at their government issued seats. Government has not given them access to the right data sets and it has not given them missions uh, that focus their talents on using these skills. This is why the commission recommends that for civilians that Congress require the Office of Personnel Management to establish career fields for government civilians and software development, software engineering, data science, knowledge management, and artificial intelligence. And for our military, Congress should direct the military chiefs to do the same for military career fields. We further call uh, for departments and agencies to provide government technologists with world-class tools, access to data sets, the right infrastructure to do these types of and sorts of jobs. If we organize the government digital workforce into departmental and agency-owned owned civilian corps, recruit and 
build talent we need into government, civilian, or military service, but fail to employ them, then we will leave, then they will leave government and pursue careers elsewhere. That's just it. Um, that's just uh, what we're faced with. And that is what we have to address, Chris. As it stands right now, so much innovation is happening outside of government, whether it's biochemical research, cybersecurity, software development. How do you leverage the private sector? How do you bring in the private sector to help in this race to develop AI? You know, in other countries that are, that are racing to develop AI, the line the barrier between the private sector and the public sector is much thinner. So we have to uh, look at ourselves in, in the mirror and recognize that existing strategies and strategies and visions uh, that we're seeing in government today are not adequately addressing all of the underlying issues, nor are they meeting the need in an expeditious fashion. Uh, there's a lack of urgency uh, uh, when we started, and there was a lack of urgency when we started, and but. Um, the good news is we're seeing that at, that is starting to change. But the government needs to decide that it wants to own internal tech talent to buy, build, and efficiently use AI and create intelligent policies and regulations for its use in and out of government. During our engagements over the past two plus years, one of the most noted deficient is talent. Few organizations have the AI talent they need to know what technology to buy and how to buy it to build the AI they need, um, uh, you know, that they, they need, um, you know, to train the rest of their workforce to manage data and to use what they have. All of this is not surprisingly for anyone who is connecting the dot and dots, um, it's resulted in a waste of money lost time, lost opportunities in our national security apparatus, and slower and less efficient delivery systems to the American people. Because we lack our own, Chris, because we lack our own, the government then turns to contractors and other parts of the private sector to play a major role in the development and acquisition of AI solutions. Now, I am a former government employee I am a consultant and I am not knocking contractors, consultants, or those um, who do business with the government. I am not doing that. But while we believe that outside talent has its place and should continue, existing government strategies do not focus on developing internal talent in sufficient quantities and that must change. Is it about making it easier for people in the private sector to join the government for kinds of tours of service and then coming back out? Or can you bring us through some of the ideas that might be applicable? Well, you know, one of those, if you, if you note, a lot of the things that we're uh, putting forth, you know, a civilian um, core, uh, that in and of itself would allow you uh, to maintain your status um, as a civilian, but operate or, or, or take part or participate up to 38 days a year uh, in, in, in a government project, in a government program to kind of jumpstart, to, um, to eat, infuse, to, and to, to share your expertise while you're not getting off your professional track. You are providing the service you wish um, to um, you know, the government that needs and wants um, while not getting off of your professional track. I, I think thinking outside of the proverbial box, you know, recognizing that talent comes from all, uh, you know, corners of, of the, um, you know, of, of this country, of the world. I think recognition of that and ensuring that there are uh, open pathways uh, to that uh, will, I think, if employed, we will see um, upwards of a 180 degree turn from where we are now. With simultaneously all of the high stakes that are involved in developing AI, the potential vulnerabilities it creates, the damage that it can cause, and yet also the need to bring talent into government. I know we've gotten a few questions, and this is, this is a topic that maybe we can talk about now, about how AI can be designed in an ethical manner and can be used in an ethical manner. 
And um, we're talking about the war fighting scenario, but I, I'm sure this stretches out to numerous other use cases. So how, ultimately, how did the commission look at the development of AI from an ethical standpoint? What are some of those ethical considerations? And, and Louis can speak to this too. It, it starts with the team, the composition of the team, but it also um, not divorced from that, are our standards, are our ethics, are our values. So we're talking about an and proposition. We must continually use the, the, the conjunction and, and our values, uh, and those ethics, uh, and those teams that come uh, from all parts of, the, uh, of, of this country and the world to ensure uh, that uh, those blind spots that we all have that someone else next to you on that team will see them and check them and ensure that they're not passed on to uh, the systems. That these systems are a reflection of us. We're building them, we're designing them, we're uh, deploying them. And so to think that all of a sudden magically uh, it's going to become and evolve and execute in ways that are not reflected of those inputs is just unreasonable. So again, it goes back to the people, it goes back to the values, it goes back to the principles. They all have to be integrated, not starting at the end, not starting just before it goes to market, but at inception, at the beginning, at the developmental stage. And if we were to do that, then we will build a more perfect system. I think that ethical considerations are extremely important, right? And, and as Mignon just pointed out, uh, those AI algorithms, right, uh, the data that we train it, uh, how we apply it has that cultural overlay. We, we will use, if we do it right, AI in a very different way than authoritarian states. Authoritarian states may use it for, you know, um, surveillance and for suppression, we think it should amplify democratic values. So we outline in our key considerations section of our report, right, uh, outline of ethical standards that we need to not only, in, you know, embrace, we need to enforce things like we need to develop AI systems that when it makes a decision that we can explain how that AI made those decisions. When we create data sets, we making sure that the data sets as best we can are unbiased, right? It does not reflect the biases of the data collectors who put it into the systems or the engineers who build those systems. We want to make sure as part of our principles that before we deploy any system, that is fully tested and fully evaluated. We, we, you know, some of our competitors and, and, and potential adversaries are putting systems out into even things like the battlefield, right? Without that level of testing and validation. What can we happen to, if, if that occurs? Can you, um, cause this, this subject can kind of be hard to grasp sometimes, but if you don't consider ethics and you deploy AI quickly, what could be the repercussions tangibly? Well, we all know what happens when um, our a computer runs into a bug, right? Your, your phone bricks. Um, it gives you the wrong location on your GPS. You know, all those little annoying things. Okay, now let's imagine that same similar kind of capability and mistakes done at machine speed, powered by AI at machine scale. Suddenly potentially a system targets the wrong thing. There's no, there's no human who authorized the use of that system. There's no checking of uh, rules of engagement. Now, here, this is the thing for everybody to understand who, who's trying to grapple with AI, right? It's not an all or nothing game. Yeah, the, the, the concern that people have is you, you write this block of code, and you press the button and then suddenly it just starts doing stuff and you can't like stop it. It's just like, it'll Got do it. these correlations of, of, of statistical similarity, but there's no causation. It'll start making really bad decisions. So when I say a hybrid, what we, and why we're saying narrow AI is we want to confine the AI down to a narrow course of things that have been well-tested and well-validated. 
We want to use traditional rule systems to bound the kinds of decisions that the AI is allowed to make. And we want to make sure humans, not necessarily in the loop, because, you know, again, at machine speeds, humans are not particularly good, but humans have oversight and control of when to deploy the system. And at the end of the day, held responsible for those systems that, that they deploy. So when we say safe and responsible and ethical use, it needs to continue to follow the ethical standards that we would hold humans accountable to, right? We won't let humans redline, right? A, a, a map on who, get a, who gets a loan or who gets you know, resources. We shouldn't let a computer do it at machine speed either. So we hold our values, we test those values, we design those systems, we make sure that every decision that that system makes is explainable and traceable and auditable, and we inform our leaders and users on how to use AI, when to trust it, when not to trust it. That's the AI ecosystem of ethical, safe, and responsible use. It's so more I'll, than simply the algorithm. So Chris, I'll come literally close to home where I am sitting in the place where I grew up. It is not the most economically well healed of communities. It wants to be protected. Um, the seniors two doors down, they want to be safe, but they do not want to be profiled. They should not be profiled. So when we talk about these systems, now if our uh, de uh, police departments purchase a system with multiple blind spots that do not take into account, if you, if you read me and all of a sudden, if, if my facial, you know, you using some type of facial recognition technology and I am, auto, it is automatically saying that either I'm a criminal, criminal, if it sees me at all 30 plus percent of the time, it does not see this ebony face, that is problematic. And so this is what, you know, we are saying, the principles, the values, the teams, those blind spots, the biases we have, we need to continue to lead the work to make those systems better than we are. That is when AI is for good. That is when AI is beneficial. That is when AI will help the government, particularly on a national security front, distinguish itself from its adversaries. And so we need to continually um, the, you know, in terms of the principles of making things more perfect, they're going to, you know, we're going to have to be very intentional about making this more perfect. That should always be the goal. There is no either or, there are no trade-offs when it comes to our principles, values, and standards. And, and, and that is at the bottom line. And if we put that from inception to marketplace application, uh, then we will win this race we will distinguish ourselves from our adversaries. And again, I keep saying this for a reason, we will make this a more perfect union and that should always be the goal. And, and if we're successful, we'll set the standards for the rest of the world. Like, you know, some of our recommendations included like, let's involve NIST. Let's have NIST help us set standards because the world trusts NIST. I mean, the, there are lots of measurement standards and other standards that we use that came from this that other countries adopt. In fact, it is my great hope and the great hope of the commissioners that our competitors and even our adversaries adopt the same principles, right? We do not need to make the world a more dangerous place, right? And so I think it is to everybody's interest, not just to our nation, but to the globe, that we use these technologies, right, in that safe, responsible, and ethical use. Now, we may disagree as to what is ethical use, right? And that's what diplomacy is about, right? Countries and cultures have different point of view. But there are also some minimum standards that we all agree are unsafe uses, that are unethical uses. And those are good places to start. You know, I think... The, the conversation around ethics, there's going to be very few people that disagree with you. The need to talk about ethics and design ethics and AI are important, but it's so difficult as a nation and as individuals to understand our own biases. And yet at the same time, uh, threats aren't stopping. There's homeland security threats, terrorism threats, nation state threats against the country. AI is already being deployed. 
So how do you balance the need to have that conversation, talk about biases, make those rules with the fact that the threats aren't stopping and people are deploying AI? Or is, is the US in some way at a disadvantage uh, because we need to have this conversation first or does it ultimately strengthen the deployment of this technology? I think it, it, it strengthens, right? Um, Absolutely. And, and, and the reason for that is at the end of the day, if the public doesn't trust the AI, if the, the public doesn't trust a government powered by AI, right? Then uh, the public will make the appropriate changes. Now in this country, it's hopefully done through elections, but in other countries it's done through revolution. And so I, you know, again, our communications to other world leaders is, you know, misuse of this, this, these technologies will result in a weakening government in a weakened kind of a world safety. I think the other thing that we also have to look at is we can use AI actually to protect ourselves from bias. We can use AI algorithms to detect bias that another AI algorithm generates. We can use AI to go through massive amounts of data to say this data is inappropriate to use in these conditions. And we can use AI to help us protect against offensive uses of AI in things like misinformation and cyber. So, you know, AI cuts both ways, but if we're underinvested, if we don't have the appropriate research foundation or the talent to do this, we're not gonna be able to keep up on the game, particularly if you have a competitor state like China, who is totally committed to, to be not only a leader in information technologies, but to lead the world in AI by 2030 to 2035. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing in the general things, you know, their cameras are smarter than our cameras. You know, that's maybe not good for a camera manufacturer, but it could be devastating if it's a national security issue. Chris, at the beginning and end of this, I'll just be quick and simple. We have to do AI right. And in order to do AI right, we have to make sure those adequate guardrails, those checks and balances are built within the system. Will it slow things down a bit compared uh, you know, to uh, uh, those um, who don't have the same principles? I will concede, yes, it will. Will it build a more sustainable system? I say, yes, it will. And so what is the goal? You know, what's the ultimate prize here? I say to build a more sustainable system. And that will take uh, uh, diverse teams, that will take uh, input, um, you know, uh, from, you know, all of our talented, um, including ethicists, in, in, include, so the teams have to be inclusive. We distinguish ourselves positively by those uh, diverse teams. We give ourselves a competitive edge because of those comprehensive diverse teams. That is a trade-off that we are uniquely positioned um, not to, we don't have to make that trade-off. We are new, uniquely positioned to do so. That is a intermediate and long-term advantage, no matter how uncomfortable it may build, be building in the short, you know, be for us to build it in the short term. It is an intermediate and long-term advantage. And I will bet my last dollar every day, I don't bet um, those at George Mason, but I will, <laughs> you know, that is not, um, you know, but I will bet my, uh, my virtual dollar um, on that intermediate and long-term strength. A virtual dollar might be worth more tomorrow, so hold on to it. <laughs> so this will be our last question, and then we're going to turn to um, the Q&A. We have seen your questions coming in, and we picked a few, and we'll, we'll dive into that with the last 10 minutes. So for the last question, you know, we've been dancing around this, this, this topic a bit throughout the conversation of China and how China is competing and uh, how it compares to the U.S. in terms of its artificial intelligence development so far. How do you look at China and where China is today in comparison to the U.S.? And um, what does that say about the, the, the U.S.'s um, ability to compete? What does it say about the space that's left? Well, 
you know, it's, I said that, you know, AI is the stack. Let's start with the stack, right? Um, so the stack is algorithms, hardware, i.e. microelectronics. Um, it's data, it's integration, it's application, right? You should take this out and you say, okay, where does the U.S. lead and where does China, where has China caught up and where perhaps they're leading? So in the algorithmic space, right, we, we clearly have a leadership position, right? We're, we're ahead of China today. You, you take an AI-powered system today done by the Chinese, algorithmically designed versus the U.S. It's U.S. who's generating, along with many of our allies in the West, you know, those algorithms. Um, when it comes to data, China leads at least in the areas that they're interested in because they have no restrictions to, to get the data, right? There are no, you know, I, if the government wants the data, you have to give them the data. It's not like an American company can say, the government wants, that's great, you can't have it, right? In the areas of, of um, applications, again, I think the Chinese are moving out faster than the U.S. There's Smart Cities Initiative. Um, for better or worse, their use of facial recognition, um, their ability to score their social populations and their social scoring systems, right? They are kind of ahead on that side of the game. Um, when it comes down to microelectronics, right, we're about two generations ahead, but that could easily collapse because we have a high dependency on countries like Korea, uh, South Korea and Taiwan. And as we all know, Taiwan is just, you know, 110 miles away from um, mainland China. Um, and if all of our chips or many of our chips are being produced in those factories, we're vulnerable. So, but here's the big difference between the US and China. China committed to a national strategy. They have set out the 2025 timeline that they will catch the U.S. and the West, that by 2030, they will have superior AI on all facets of that stack. And by 2049, they will have a world-class military that can win in any fight, in any domain, anywhere where the fight is needed. And for the Chinese, they view it as, you know, they were a world leader until about 1830 to 1840, right? Uh, they had 100 years of humiliation, and they think and feel strongly that the rise of China back to the world leadership goes through information technologies and disruptive technology where, with AI being a predominant key part of that strategy. Whereas the U.S., we still have not adopted a strategy. The commission goes a long ways in recommendations, but we're only a commission. It is up to the White House, it's up to Congress, it's up to our industrial base to make that same level of commitment. And again, unlike China, where China can just simply vote in and say, we're going to do this, and they have civil military fusion, and this can take any resource they want to throw out the problem, we choose to do it in a democratic way. And I think me and I both believe, along with the other commissioners, that democratic values will eventually keep us in the lead but that's only if we're willing to, to commit to the resources necessary to make this a successful endeavor. So Chris, I'll add to that if you can hear me. I am having, um, I would name the provider, but I guess that would be rude. Look, um, I, I cannot, um, you know, stress, uh, begin to stress uh, the importance of what you just heard from Louie. Um, uh, I always called him from Gilman. I always want to call him, um, you know, by his last name. Um, but Gilman, the commissioner Louis just mentioned to you uh, uh, something that he illustrated to me on a panel a few months ago. He showed me this slide of a kindergarten textbook, I believe it was, that had AI written on it. Now, that made me pause and should make, make each of you pause. To win the race, you have to be committed. And there is no early age or late age for us to do so in terms of uh, you know, being focused on what is important, being focused 
on, um, you know, being trained and ready, being focused and committed um, on our national security. Uh, there is no expiration date when it comes to that. This is an all in, all on um, uh, an effort. And so we uh, have to continue to leverage our principles uh, and our standards and our values, um, you know, to reflect that. And Commissioner Clyburn, I think you're on mute. Yeah, it might happen. If, it might help if I put uh, unmute myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> I never that never happens to me, and, and it, it just did. But it is really important um, for us to be fixated um, on this, fixated, um, you know, on our security because we all have a role and a stake to play in it. It is just that important. It is just that critical. And whether you serve or not. I never have, whether you've been like me, you know, 19 plus, you know, so so years in government or not, um, it is important, it is critical, it is deserving of our atten attention. And when you send that little one to school, part of their curriculum needs to be AI infused. You need to insist on it, um, not just for national security purposes, but in order for them to be competitive um, and to protect themselves. Um, as we um, continue along this progressive, uh, more AI-dependent uh, path. Thank you, Commissioner. So we um, have about 10 minutes left. I know there's been a bunch of questions. Um, we have a limited amount of time, and I'm sorry about that, but we're going to dive into the first one here right away, and we'll try and make it relatively rapid fire. Um, the first question deals with this, this concern about going quickly from a weak AI or a narrow AI to something that's self-perceiving and uh, getting to singularity. And I know this is a question that I'm sure neighbors have given you, this idea of kind of AI developing its own uh, self-perception and defending itself, kind of Skynet style question, the common cultural question. What do you, what do you say about that kind of concern? I say it's an important concern to frame how we think about the development of AI. You know, look, I, I grew up, you know, I was uh, in elementary school and, and I always say, you know, all great technologies start with Star Trek, right? If it was never, we never saw it in Star Trek that you don't have to worry about. So this is this great episode where um, the Daystrom Institute the, designs this computer system that replaced Captain Kirk called the M5. And it, you know, basically goes crazy and like blows up all the other starships in, in, in this war game, right? So even in the 60s, they were worried about this problem. Um, some would just simply say, look, we're a long ways off from, from narrow AI evolving into this unrestricted kind of general AI where it kind of goes them up. Because of that, if you understand that, you start with the foundational elements that you do not design systems without guardrail rails. It's really important. It doesn't matter whether you use AI or just general computer code, right? You do not want to have the systems going off and running processes that are outside of those rails. Second, right? You need to have the ability to have human intervention. When things go really, really bad, you need to be able to hit the big stop button in the sky, right? And there's another principle that we say very clearly in the report, right? Algorithms should not be allowed to escalate a conflict without human permission, right? That escalation right? That's where things get bad in a hurry. Now that's going to require dialogue with our competitors. Just like we have a dialogue second back channel with the Russians on nuclear matters, we need to have the same thing on these kinds of matters. And we need to have similar channels with countries like China, right? And then hopefully one day North Korea and Iraq and other places, I mean, Iran and other places like that. But we need to have that discussion because at some point 
responsible nations need to set down the foundational responsible uses of these technology. We should not be using these technologies, for example, to make a decision to do a first strike. We should not put nuclear weapons in an algorithm's hands. So, well, again, these concerns are in some ways a long ways off. The principles are here today and we need to design systems, test and validate systems and use systems that are designed from the beginning to have those guardrails. Another question here about um, how artificial intelligence and machine learning has to depend on databases that exist today in order to learn and develop. And the idea that those databases um, may have bias already, and the need to avoid bias in these existing databases and the challenge there maybe to create new databases or the limitations that exist because these databases are the way that they are. What do you say about that question, the dependence on existing databases in order to develop? Well, I go back and, and Louis could uh, probably answer this better. And I'm going to integrate my answer with, um, uh, since I lost um, my connection, I lost most of the chat, but um, uh, uh, someone who um, uh, challenged probably my notion of, uh, that this is not about winning um, you know, a race when I answer uh, the question. Um, I grew up um, uh, two and a half blocks from my elementary school. By every test score and other indicator, I, it is the bottom, among the bottom of the bottom in our school district, in our state. So when I talk about um, ensuring that there are teams uh, that have the guardrails, that have um, you know, the checks and balances that other members of the team have, that's winning a race. When I talk about the inequities that exist um, uh, in, in South Carolina with minimally adequate is okay education and minimally adequate was on my side of the track and not other, that is about winning a race to challenge that, to ensure that uh, the curriculum that I have is on par with others to ensure that that curriculum and those milestones that um, uh, a more evenness by way of uh, uh, educational and other opportunities are realized uh, by everyone in this country. That's about winning the race if, for all of us to be our better selves, to be a part of these systems, to ensure that they do not have um, the bias that they would have without people like me. So when we speak about uh, the teams, when we speak about our values, when we speak about that prin those principles, if I am under-resourced and under-educated, if I don't have the, um, uh, the uh, capacity, or if you make the assumptions because I went to one school and not another, that I'm not worthy to be on a team, then we're going to have perpetual built-in biases. So yes, to me, it's about winning a race, but not how you organically think about it. It's about ensuring that no matter where you live, that you are a part of our AI future, no matter who you are or, or how, um, you know, what you, the degree of lightness or darkness of your skin, that you have a part and you um, should be a, a part of these teams in our AI future and our government uh, and the decision-making that forms these values. So if I sound a little defensive, maybe I am, but it's just that important that we recognize that there's a lot of unevenness um, out um, in, uh, the, uh, in this country, particularly by way of education and access to opportunities, and we have to address that. So my five-year-old nephew who goes to the same elementary school that I went to, does not have the type of challenge uh, that I did. Yeah, and then the, the data standards are really, really important. And, and that requires us to minimally refactor data as long as we're dependent on current algorithms that require large amounts of data to train itself um, to, to take as much of that bias out. That's why we think NIST has a voice to say as to what are good data standards what are good collection standards, right? How do you actually test for bias? Um, so you can actually measure it on the other side. And, you know, as we just heard the importance of uh, 
you know, I've been quoted as saying, this is not a race, but you don't want to finish second, right? So it's kind of that, that, that like, huh, what's that supposed to mean? Look, the race is not about necessarily us versus China, right? Or us versus Russia. The race is the ability to take this technology for the benefit of, of humankind, for the benefit of the planet. In many areas, we can be collaborating with the Chinese and Russia, right? On research, on basic science, on discovery and on exploration and on medicine and on healthcare. Now, clearly, you know, we do not want to have inferior weapon systems and inferior defensive systems on cyber or misinformation because that will put us in a period of vulnerability. They don't want to have that either, right? So they're going to move ahead to have the best and we're going to move ahead to have the best. And hopefully we can check each other in a way that we both can act like responsible nations and other nations can do the same thing as well. Um, but in the bigger scheme, the race is against ourselves, right? And, and that is, can the technology base, can the human citizens of responsible nations like the United States, can we move the ball forward using these technologies to improve the lives of every American? And I think the answer, and the commissioners think the answer is yes. And we think we can also do it while protecting the security of this nation against other threats that are out there. I think that's a great point to end on. Uh, I'd like to thank Commissioner Louie, Commissioner Clyburn for their time today. And I'm going to turn it, all, turn it over to Jamil for some ending words. Thanks, everyone. And thanks so much again, Chris, to you for hosting this and to Commissioners Louie and Clyburn for a great reminder that at the end of the day, when it comes to artificial intelligence or any of these modern technologies, it's about ensuring access, equity, and ensuring that we really come together as a nation and really join hands to move this forward and we don't forget our values. And on that note, thank you all for being here. Uh, next Thursday, June 3rd, 3 p.m., we'll be releasing a fireside chat entitled Silence of the Radio, Freedom of Press in Russia, featuring Jamie Fly, the president and CEO of Radio Free, Free Europe, Radio Liberty. And also uh, keep your calendars open for June 16th. We'll be talking about the semiconductor supply chain. Thank you for all being here. This is the National Security Institute. Thanks to Commissioner Clyburn, Commissioner Louie, and Chris. Thanks to you for hosting. Have a great afternoon, everybody.